Okay, welcome to another live session on any topic in astronomy. The floor is open. All right, the first question is, um, if nothing can travel faster than light, how can the universe expand faster than light? Um, so that's a good question, and in fact implies an answer that the universe did expand faster than light, which it did during the first third of its existence. Um, which is to say any two points in space were moving away from each other faster than 300,000 kilometers per second for the first roughly four or five billion years after the Big Bang. So the speed limit of light as a fundamental limit emerges from special relativity, Einstein's theory about relative motion, uniform relative motion, um, where uh, as a way of accommodating the fact that the speed of light seemed to be independent of the motion of the observer. That was by direct observation, the Michelson-Morley experiment, a null result trying to look for a difference in the speed of light uh, relative to the Earth's motion, and it was never found. Uh, Einstein elevated the constancy and the absolute limit of the speed of light to a premise of his theory of special relativity, which has been affirmed many ways. However, special relativity doesn't deal with the situation of accelerating situations and it doesn't deal with gravity. So Einstein moved from his special theory of relativity in 1905 to his general theory in 1916. And in the general theory, which essentially subsumes the special theory of relativity, he's dealing with the situation of gravity and accelerated motion. In general relativity as applied to the universe as an expanding entity, uh, there is no speed limit. So in general relativity, there's no speed limit to the way that space-time, a hyphenated entity now, the three dimensions of space and one of time are, have to be considered together. There's no limit in the theory to the rate at which space-time can expand. And so um, there's no problem, no conflict with physics for the universe to expand faster than light early in its history. Um, if you were within that universe at that time doing physics experiments on an on a Earth-like planet or in a terrestrial solar system type situation, you'd still see special relativity obeyed, which is to say on the small scales of the Earth or solar system or a small chunk of that large expanding universe, the speed of light as a limit and special relativity would be obeyed. But on the largest cosmic scale of expanding space-time of the universe as a whole, um, the speed of light is not a limit. And in fact, taking it back even further to 400,000 years after the Big Bang, which is the era from which we see the microwave radiation, our, our best evidence that the universe had a hot, early, dense state, that radiation we see with microwave telescopes and satellites um, represents radiation when the universe was a thousand times smaller and a thousand times hotter than it is now. And at that time, uh, any two places in space or any two places on the map you see of the microwaves were actually moving apart at about 45 times the speed of light. So in the very early universe, this uh, speed limit of the speed of light was vi you know, violently violated, if you like, by the very rapid expansion. Right, the next question is from Jake, who is on with us live, who asks, what are your opinions on the Mars presentation from Elon Musk last week? So it's a big news story, and I've been was on Canadian Broadcasting News Show just this morning talking about it. Had a few interviews. Uh, obviously, a big story. That for those who haven't seen it, and it's hard to avoid because Elon Musk does generate a lot of publicity. He was at an international aeronautics conference in Mexico, and he had a big press release and press conference about his very visionary plans for Mars colonization of using SpaceX rockets. So in the short story, it's quite a lot of information that he provided in this press conference, but he's planning to scale up his capabilities enormously uh, to have a rocket uh, that is powered by essentially 40, more than 40 of his individual rockets that he uses in the Falcon uh, rocket that he has now carrying something like 500 metric tons to Earth orbit and then beyond. And these rockets actually are reusable, of the capsule and the, uh, the, you know, the fuel tanks are reusable, that's part of his cheap economic model. They actually propel the, the spaceship beyond Earth 
gravity fast enough that it shortens the travel time to Mars down to about three months from the current eight or nine months. Um, so he's looking at a fast trip to Mars. He's looking at sending very large payloads, just using extrapolations and extensions of current technology. And his aggressive time scale calls for the first of these flights to be in 2022. Um, the construction of a colony and a viable self-sustaining colony obviously is a long process that would take a decade or so after that. But then he paints a picture going out a century from now where as many as a million people are now living on Mars, a uh, completely separate uh, colony, large colony, obviously the size of a big city on Earth, um, and what he paints as an offshoot of the human tree, so a, a new species essentially, and eventually as they start breeding and become distinct from humanity. Um, my views on it are, you know, at one level, great, good, good to him because he's one of the leaders in the private space industry, and it's good to have ambition. It's good to have grand plans. I think, in the end, Mars colonization will happen, and I think Musk has the technology to do it. I just think he underestimated, perhaps deliberately, the speed with which he can do it, and he underestimated for sure the expense and difficulty of doing it. Uh, but that's not to say it's impossible. I also think, uh, in a, at a more subtle level, he painted a false dichotomy. His, his uh, sort of apocalyptic uh, vein of his press conference was to present it as a dichotomy between us waiting around on Earth for the essentially the extinction or catastrophic event that will wipe out life on Earth, or going to live on Mars as a place where we can uh, escape from the problems of Earth. That's a kind of a dire dichotomy, and I, I don't think that dichotomy is real. There's obviously a third option, which is to muddle through and somehow get our house in order so that the Earth is not destroyed. A catastrophic event like a asteroid or meteor impact is a multi-million year, most likely, event. And and if it's shorter than that, there's a good chance we could head it off. So our, our demise, our catastrophic demise, is really in our own hands, and I'm not as pessimistic as him as to the likelihood of that happening. So I don't think it's a simple dichotomy. I also think uh, all of these things can happen together. I think that the Mars colonization project will proceed either through SpaceX or other players. Um, and it'll happen independent of how well or badly we're doing on the Earth. We'll never have the ability to send more than a tiny fraction of the Earth's inhabitants to some other location, especially Mars. So it's completely implausible, e even in Musk's dreams, for us to truly relocate to Mars. What he's really talking about is building a large colony that eventually grows and becomes a, a separate outpost of humanity. And, and I agree with him. I think eventually that will happen. Not as quickly as maybe a million people in a hundred years. That's extremely aggressive time scale. Uh, but I think it will happen. All right, the next question is from Ilsa, who is on with us live. Is the Mars retrograde motion something unusual, or is it a run-of-the-mill event from any two objects order, uh, orbiting a star? It's, um, it, it's unusual. It has great historic value, of course. I mean, the, the simple answer is that it's run-of-the-mill. In any uh, solar system, and now we found many solar systems out there beyond the sun, um, the planets are likely to have regular motions. And so the planets are likely to all orbit their stars in the same direction. The planets are also likely to be governed by Kepler's laws, which means that the interior planets will be moving faster in their orbit. And so simply because planets have regular orbits that, that follow Kepler's laws, it's uh, likely that something like Mars retrograde motion will be seen for other planets out in the world of exoplanets. Uh, if you happen to be on an interior planet looking at an outer planet moving more slowly in its orbit, you will see it do retrograde motion. So what we see for Mars and to a lesser extent for Jupiter, Saturn, and all the outer planets would be seen by inhabitants of other star systems. So in that sense, it's a very routine event, something we would expect. Obviously, in, in our case, it's important First, because it's one of the best pieces of positional astronomy that the average person can enjoy. Uh, Mars is a easily visible and uh, noted by its color naked eye object, and it does its retrograde every couple of years, which is to say every couple of years the Earth 
overtakes Mars on the inside, moving faster on the inside track in its orbit of the sun. And so for a couple of months, about six or seven weeks, Mars appears to reverse its normal east to west progression among the stars. And then it picks up that forward motion again. And that, uh, mo that regression, that retrograde phase of a month or so out of a couple of years and happening every couple of years is a very notable behavior that you can see with your naked eye. It's kind of fun to watch it over a period of a few months when the next one's coming. It also played a critical role in the history of astronomy because it was Mars retrograde motion that contributed to the idea that the Earth was not the center of the universe. If the Earth's the center of the universe and the sun, the moon, and all the planets go around us on, uh, on carried by celestial spheres or whatever the mechanism was at the time of the Greeks and through the medieval time, then it's very artificial and arbitrary for one of the planets to suddenly back up for a while and then continue forward. You essentially just have to invent that as a strange mechanism only for some of the planets and not others. In the heliocentric model, where the sun's the center of the solar system and the Earth is just one of the planets orbiting the sun, that retrograde motion is naturally understood if the Earth's on an interior orbit. Venus and Mercury don't show retrograde motion because their orbits are interior to ours. So the observation of retrograde motion, which obviously had been done for thousands of years, it was done by ancient people long before there was astronomy and they didn't really know what they were looking at, became a critical argument at the time of Copernicus through to the time of Galileo in overturning the ancient view of the universe. Right, and the next question is from Avik, who's on with us live, are astrophysicists actively working on multiverse theories either to prove or disprove the existence of one or more types of multiverses? Uh, yes, there's a theoretical uh, effort involved in the multiverse scenario. Um, it's tricky, though, because you're missing some of the basic input physics. Um, the multiverse concept arises out of the quantum genesis notion, the idea that the universe was once small enough to have been only describable as a quantum phenomenon, and that perhaps the genesis of the universe was quantum creation, perhaps from false vacuum or from borrowed energy from the vacuum of a previous state. And in that situation where the universe is essentially a quantum fluctuation that inflated to a subsequent large size, there could be other uh, events, other quantum events leading to other universes. And that's the, the, that's the overall idea of the multiverse theory. And those different universes, the different space-times, if you like, would have very different properties, indeed different laws of physics. So it's an interesting question of how you test that kind of idea. Uh, and at the moment, it's not really a testable idea. Some physicists, some cosmologists are, are fairly resistant to the idea of the multiverse because they don't think it's part of the normal apparatus of science where you make unique and testable predictions and those predictions are either borne out or not and you either reject the theory or accept it or modify it and move on. Multiverse hasn't got to that stage. And part of that is because uh, we don't have a quantized theory of gravity or string theory or any theory that can describe the state from which the universe emerged and other universes may have been part of some ensemble that preceded the Big Bang. We simply don't have a, a robust theory. And so obviously we don't therefore have a robust way of calculating predictions of the multiverse, like how many universes are there and what are their range of properties. People are still making arguments. So there are many theoretical papers. There are probably several dozen theoretical papers a year written on the multiverse idea combined in various ways with string theory and quantum gravity, as you have to, because those are the theories you need to talk about multiverse. Um, but still, it's exploratory theoretical work. And the best, I would say, is that some of these theories have reached the point where potentially the context out of which our universe emerged could have been a situation which would leave a gravity wave imprint in our universe. In other words, there could be a signature of gravity waves observable in our universe as a whole, and maybe potentially by LIGO or succeeding experiments like that, that would detect the imprint on our overall space-time, our overall expanding universe, uh, of the fact that there are other space-times out there, other expanding universes, or, or maybe not expanding, but a multiverse context. 
So that's the avenue that people are working towards to have something that you can really observe. But it's it's not mature theory yet. Um, so another uh, viewer on with us live asks, the space station is parked somewhere, right? Could it be moved somewhere else or flown, for example, to another planet? Um, the space station is about 360 uh, miles or I don't want to get this right I think it's kilometers up and it's um, it's in an orbit that does actually decay slightly so the space station needs orbital boosting um, it's at a it's at a fairly high that's not that's a low earth orbit technically but it's a high low earth orbit if you like because the truly low earth orbits are getting so full of space junk that the space station would be in jeopardy it's already in some jeopardy because there is space junk at its slightly higher elevation. So the space station is in an orbit which, although above essentially all of the Earth's atmosphere, is just so it is subject to very slight drag from the very most tenuous outer extension of the Earth's atmosphere. And that means that the uh, space station's orbit is, is gradually degrading. And uh, it's clear the space station and has already been had its orbit boosted slightly over its long time there over a decade if nothing is done with the space station it will actually deorbit by itself in an accelerating way in a couple of years and so decision is actually being faced with the space station of whether to let it naturally deorbit and fall into the ocean and of course pick the trajectory for doing that so that it doesn't happen over any landmass um, or keep the space station, boost its orbit, and keep it going for some number of years more. Um, the space station is sort of in a political and financial limbo in that regard. As for moving the space station further away entirely, that would be impossible, essentially. The space station is a large structure. It's uh, 70 or 80 meters across at its long. It's got long, spindly um, uh, pieces of uh, tubing essentially that people live in and work and play in um, and so it's a big structure i don't remember how many tons but it's a huge structure to take the space station from a circular orbit of the earth or slightly elliptical orbit of the earth to escape velocity would be in newtonian physics that's a factor of root two square root of two 1.414 so you'd have to boost its speed by 40 percent to liberate it from the Earth's gravity. And that's a phenomenal amount of energy, and the rockets essentially don't exist to do that. So space station, uh, although in principle it could travel between the planets, I mean, it's it's clearly a sealed, protected unit that, with its own life support. Uh, in practice, it's never gonna do that. All right, the next question is, uh, how many dimensions are there? Uh, I heard some people talking about possibly 11 dimensions. Right, so this alludes a little back to a previous question about the multiverse. The, the ultimate theories of matter, which, um, so just to back up a little bit, um, the conventional physics of the universe that we live in and think we understand fairly well is, is essentially four dimensional, three dimensions of space and one of time. And in the very successful theory of, theories of special and general relativity, those those dimensions really are coupled. We have to think of space-time as a unified entity. We, we shouldn't think of the time dimension separately from the space dimensions. Uh, and that's fairly familiar now after a century. That's quite old established physics. But the standard model of particle physics, the fundamental idea of what matter is made of, has run into some problems because the standard model of particle physics, for example, declares the electron to be a point mass. It has no size, has no dimension in the standard model, which is a very successful model. It explains you know, lab physics and accelerator physics quite well. Well, electron obviously has mass and it obviously has charge. So if it's a point particle in the theory, that implies infinite mass density and infinite charge density, and that's unphysical. That's just one example, but there are several others where the standard model is clearly an incomplete description of nature um, because we've never seen substructure in the electron and yet it's nonsensical for an electron to have infinite mass density. Um, so the theory needs to be improved. And to go beyond the standard theory uh, without just adding bells and whistles is actually quite hard because it's fairly mature and it describes its range of physics fairly well. 
So what people have done is they've gone back to the drawing board, to square one, and they've conceptualized a completely different view of the fundamental nature of matter. And they're motivated, of course, by bringing the quantum theory and general relativity, the theory of gravity, under one umbrella, because we eventually will need some sort of theory of nature that involves all four forces. At the moment, the particle physics theories involve the unification of three of those forces quite successfully, many experiments to show that, but gravity is left out of the picture. So these more profound theories, which of which string theory is the one that gets talked about the most, but there are other terms for this M theory, where M stands for membrane, which are multidimensional entities with higher dimensions. Um, these theories started being developed actually 35 years ago, quite a long time ago, in the early 80s, and they've just matured slowly. So all of these attempts to reach beyond the standard uh, toolkit of physics to explain gravity and the four forces of nature together uh, end up mathematically involving hidden dimensions or dimensions beyond the three of space and one of time. Depending on the variation of the theory, that those spatial, extra spatial dimensions could add up to a total of nine or 10 or 11, as the questioner asked. And the distinctions as to which of these theories is favored is that's not clear because the theory is not tested or verified. But essentially, all of these string theories and M theories uh, involve hidden dimensions. They're hidden because these extra dimensions beyond the three of space and the one of time that we're familiar with uh, are only accessible when we reach incredible energies. Formally, these energies are 10 to the power 19 giga electron volts. That's the energy at which, in an accelerator, you can't do it, but in ex that's the energy at which, in nature, all the four forces of nature become equal. So these theories all involve extra dimensions and, and a number of extra dimensions that are essentially compactified or invisible to us at terrestrial and everyday energies, but represent a more fundamental way of viewing nature. Um, we seem to be having a bit of a trouble with the stream. It's not showing up on YouTube Live, so um, I'm not sure what to do. If we should just keep going with archived questions and then save this, or if we should try restarting the stream. I'm, I'm afraid it's going to not come up with the same URL. Yeah, well, it, we can put it up after the fact, right? That's what I think. So. I think that's better. Okay, I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. immediately, but I just wanted to. Okay, the next question is from email, what would have happened if there was no time, like in the entire universe, no calendar, no past or future? Is there any way to tell what would be different if time was different in our universe? So it's an interesting hypothetical about the, the nature of time or the persistence of time as a, as a visible part of our universe. So the universe does seem to have a time arrow, a forward arrow. And, and the nature of time is still mysterious. The physicists, philosophers, neuroscientists, even from the psychological aspects, our awareness of time is important too, um, have not fully understood time. But the universe does have a time arrow, which is to say the universe evolves. The universe is different now than it was a billion years ago or 13 billion years ago or at the time of the Big Bang. So in the sense of the universe evolving, it makes sense to talk about an arrow of time. And that arrow manifests on many different scales. It manifests obviously on terrestrial scales. We see phenomenon um, on the earth where if we made a movie and ran the movie backwards, the backwards movie is implausible. And so we can tell that time really only marches in one direction. In the universe as a whole, um, that is not as obvious because you could make the movie of the universe run backwards and you wouldn't necessarily be breaking any law of physics. Also, microscopic scales, the arrow of time tends to run forward and backward equally well. Um, microscopic physics or subatomic physics has a very slight time asymmetry, but for the most part, it's time symmetric. So what we think is that the presence of an arrow of time is somehow related to the systems of large numbers of objects or large numbers of particles, and it's sort of related to the thermodynamic idea of entropy. Um, entropy is the amount of disorder, or in physics terms, it's the number of equivalent states of a system that cannot be distinguished. 
the history of the universe is one to, towards increasing entropy. That's the second law of thermodynamics. And in any complex system with many moving parts or many particles or any large chunk of the universe, we see a movement towards larger entropy. So the question then actually becomes, for the if the universe shows an arrow of time, and if this arrow of time is associated with the second law of thermodynamics or the tendency to increasing disorder or increasing entropy, the question may become, why did the universe start in such a highly ordered or low entropy state? Because if the universe had started in a very high entropy state, a chaotic or high entropy state, it's possible that no time arrow would be obvious and the universe would not have a time dimension, even as we lived in it and experienced it. So the question of why is there a time arrow and how might it be different has now devolved to a question of why the universe initially had very low disorder or low entropy. And that becomes a question of the initial conditions of the Big Bang. And cosmologists are, are puzzled by that. They're actually casting around for ways that they can explain why the universe had low entropy at the, at the outset. All right, the next question is, do you have any thoughts on wormholes? Do you think they exist? And is it possible to, time tra or sorry, to travel through time with wormholes? So um, Kip Thorne's written a very good popular book, Black Holes and White Holes and Wormholes. I can't remember. It has a long title. It was written about 12 years ago, and I recommend it highly. He's uh, a very esteemed physicist at Caltech. He's probably going to get be one of the three getting Nobel Prize for the gravity wave discovery, since he was a theorist, the main theorist behind the LIGO project. Um, and so he's written about this in a semi-popular way, as well as anyone. Who, uh, at, who as a theorist truly understands the relativity of the situation. And he argues fairly convincingly um, that wormholes, um, sort of tunneling of space time, is not ruled out in principle, but it's certainly possible. It's not against general relativity. It's not against our laws of physics. In the universe we live in, there's no evidence that wormholes exist. There is evidence that black holes exist. We've seen regions of space where the density of matter is so high, those regions are pinched off from us and therefore unavailable to us, inaccessible to us uh, in terms of information flow behind an event horizon. So there's almost certain that black holes exist of various different sizes in the universe. But there's no implication by observation that those pinched off regions of space-time connect to another part of space-time, which would be sort of the other end of a black hole would be the white hole or the wormhole would be the connection. And in fact, the universe as a whole seems to be rather dull in terms of its space-time. The universe does not have a lot of uh, complex structure or corrugation or curvature of the space-time. Mostly on large-scale space is fairly flat. So if there were wormholes sort of interconnecting very different regions of space-time, um, we haven't found them. We haven't found situations where that occurs. But yes, in theory, Wormholes are possible. You could imagine, hypothetically, in a way that doesn't violate physics, it just doesn't seem to be the universe we live in or can access. You can have situations where different pieces of space-time are connected to each other. And yes, since space and time are coupled as an entity space-time, some of those regions could involve <coughs> the possibility and principle of time, time traveling. Also, this is possible in theory and in principle inside a rotating black hole. Uh, there's a time-like curve inside the um, event horizon of a spinning black hole where in principle it's possible to move along this curve and sample time forward and backward. So time travel associated with black holes or white holes or wormholes, whichever term you want to use, is possible in principle. We've just not found any place in the universe where we could look at this experiment or make it happen. All right, the next question is from email. Um, can you help clear up my confusion about gravity? What is it? I mean, um, my understanding is that it's a distortion of space by mass that creates an attraction called gravity, but physicists are looking for a particle. How do these connect to each other, and what is gravity? Right, so it's a simple question, but of course a good one, because the nature of gravity has puzzled physicists for a long time. Um, the, the first thing to say is that the the concept of gravity out of general relativity is really very different from the 
concept of gravity from Newton, the, the classical theory of gravity we had for hundreds of years that, that worked very well and still works very well when gravity is weak. So the gravity of Newton is a situation where an object exerts a force, an attractive force on any other object, and we can calculate that force and then the objects move in through space in response to that force. It's a sort of ballistic theory of gravity, if you like. Objects moving through space in response to gravity, which is just a force that each acts on the other, according to Newton's law of gravity, an inverse square law of force. Einstein's theory paints a very different picture. In Einstein's theory, there is no uh, force acting at a distance in that way, in a ballistic sense. What happens is that mass, also energy, because mass and energy are equivalent according to E equals mc squared, so we'll call that a hyphenated entity too. Mass energy uh, distorts or bends or curves space-time. That's the essence of Einstein's theory of general relativity. And because mass energy distorts or bends space-time, that means that particles, smaller objects say, um, will travel through that curved space-time on a simple straight line ballistic trajectory and they're just like following a roller coaster. They're just going up and down and in and out and curving one way or the other according to the curvature of space time. Um, so that's a very different view of gravity. That's, that's gravity as a geometric theory of space where the shape of space, its curvature and so on, is related to the energy density of mass. Um, and then the particles just follow that curvature. And so far that theory has been followed. Um, and John Wheeler, the man, the physicist uh, from the 1960s, I think in 1964, he actually coined the term black hole, but he was a famous physicist for many reasons. He said, uh, gravity tells mass how to move and mass tells space how to curve, or rather, sorry, space tells mass how to move and mass tells space how to curve. That was his bi-directional way of describing general relativity. All right, the next question is, um, if the two descriptions of gravity are so difficult to reconcile, what evidence is there that gravity is in fact a fundamental force instead of an artifact of something else? So the, the, we're asking now about the validity of our current theory of gravity, general relativity, this, this idea that mass energy curves space-time. Uh, and all the phenomena we observe are a result of that effect. There's actually a, a lot of evidence now. General relativity has passed its tests with flying colors. Um, the, f the first test is, can we see this space-time curvature? And the answer is yes. In astronomy, we have, thanks to especially Hubble Space Telescope, we have thousands of images taken by the Hubble and, and many by ground-based telescopes that show gravitational lensing. They show uh, images, distant galaxies distorted by the gravity of an intervening object, like a galaxy or a cluster of galaxies, into arcs or perfect circles or, or strange or multiple image formations and so on, just like a big gravitational optic experiment. The universe um, shows that mass is bending light on all different scales as it travels through the universe. And we, we've seen that thousands of times. And the, and the amount of the deflection, the magnification or the demagnification, the image splitting, all the phenomena are beautifully explained by general relativity. Another test of general relativity is, uh, these are physically related, there's the gravitational redshift and gravitational time dilation. So another phenomenon of the theory is that uh, stronger gravity slows down time and in escaping from stronger gravity, light or any form of radiation uh, loses energy. So it ha it's essentially climbing against the gravity field or force, and so it loses energy, which amounts to a redshift. So these interrelated ideas of uh, radiation losing energy or being redshifted by gravity and time flowing slower uh, in a stronger gravity field, these have been tested as well. and and confirmed with flying colors. They've been tested mostly in a regime where the gravity is weak, like the Earth itself. Um, in the classic test of the time dilation effect, uh, identical atomic clocks were taken thousands, tens of thousands of feet up in a, in a high-flying spy plane in the 1950s, it was first done, uh, and then compared 
to a clock, a sim an identical atomic clock that had stayed on the Earth's surface. And indeed, the one on the Earth's surface kept slightly different time, kept slightly slower time than the atomic clock that was lifted in the Earth's gravitational field. That experiment has been done so exquisitely accurately that in the lab just a couple of years ago, it was shown the clocks actually run slower over a, dist a vertical distance in the lab of just a meter. It's, it's a phenomenally precise experiment to show that because zero's gravity is not that strong. So general relativity time running slower in a strong gravity field, that's been shown. The gravitational redshift effect has been shown and then the bending of light or any form of radiation by gravity has been shown time and time again. So this does seem to be a valid concept for gravity. All right, so the next question is about definitions in astronomy. And it says, a recent Jeopardy question asked for the nearest star, and the answer, Alpha Centauri, was wrong in favor of Proxima Centauri, the dwarf star. Why does this dwarf star count as a star, but dwarf planet Pluto no longer counts as a planet? So, um, right, it's a good question. It's not just semantics, um, the because they are the distinctions are separate. So Proxima Centauri is a red dwarf, so it's a dwarf star. And when astronomers are talking about stars, they use the term dwarf and giant to essentially just describe the size of the star relative to the sun. The sun being a main sequence star in the middle of the mass range of main sequence stars, it, it's not an average size star, star in a sort of arithmetic sense of being average, but it's in the middle of the range of stars. So stars that are that are much less uh, that are much smaller than the sun, maybe ten or more times smaller than the sun, are are cool if they're main sequence stars, but fusing hydrogen into helium as the sun is, and they're called dwarfs, and they're red because they're cool, uh, so they're called red dwarfs. So Proxima Centauri is a is a dwarf star. It's much smaller than the sun, but it's still a fundamentally similar object because it's a fusion reactor converting hydrogen into helium, the red dwarf is just doing that at a rate that's hundreds or thousands of times slower than the sun is. So, so that doesn't make it a different kind of entity. In the planet arena, it's much more argumentative because uh, planets can be very different sizes and the distinction of, and, and there's a continuous size distribution where eventually the smallest dwarf planet is going to overlap with the largest asteroid or, or the largest piece of space debris that you have out there. So where do you draw the line? Where do you make the distinction between a planet or even a dwarf planet and just a piece of a large piece of space debris? Uh, Ceres, the largest asteroid, is about a thousand kilometers across. Um, it's an asteroid because it's in the asteroid belt, but how much larger would it have to be before you'd call it a dwarf planet? These are all good questions. and. In planetary science, the distinctions are a little more arbitrary, but generally, and, and the basis for demoting Pluto was the fact that Pluto has not cleared out its own, has not declared its own gravitational realm in the solar system in terms of a, a set of orbits near it where it has cleared out all the debris and it sort of governs the gravity of a, a, a zone in the solar system. Pluto is not massive enough to do that. It's also in a highly ellipt in an elliptical and an inclined orbit, which give to astronomers give it the signature of an object that was captured from much further out. So it wasn't there at the birth of the solar system in its current location. So those are really the two reasons Pluto is an oddball and was demoted uh, from being a fully fledged planet to a dwarf planet. Um, a regular planet has to have sufficient mass to be round. That's that's one of the other requirements too, because gravity makes something round. Uh, and if it's not big enough, like most asteroids, those are not spherical objects. Um, so that's another distinction. Uh, but also it has to have its own realm, if you like, in the solar system gravitationally. And Pluto doesn't have that. All right, the next question is, is there an alternative method other than laser interferometry through which through which gravitational waves can be measured? Um, that's a good question. Uh, yes, there, there's uh, probably the most exciting second method for detecting gravity waves is using pulsars as timekeeping pieces. So, and, and there have been um, tests of this idea. 
so the so the principle is this um that pulsars are the most exquisite clocks we know of uh in principle their periods are precise to about one part in ten to the 16 or something like that the best atomic clocks that best atomic clocks are as good or better than that now because optical clock technology has advanced substantially but anyway pulsars are exquisite timekeeping pieces a pulsar out there in the nearby part of the milky way when a gravitational wave passes a, over a pulsar it perturbs that pulsar it actually uh you know there's some energy passed between the gravity wave and the pulsar and that alters the timing of the pulsar sometimes temporarily and sometimes permanently uh, or it might give it a slight amount of precession since a pulsar is a rapidly spinning sort of gyroscopic object so the principle then is that if you had a network of pulsars out there in space just naturally occurring compact stellar objects left over when a massive star dies and you were using them as timekeeping pieces as gravity wave passes over the grid or the array in three dimensions of pulsars it would alter their timing properties in a subtle way that you could measure because you have such exquisitely precise timekeeping and so people are going through the theory of this of what happens to a pulsar when a gravity wave passes over it but there is a measurable effect in principle and it's that the precision or current timekeeping can see this effect uh, and that now is becoming a principle for setting up pulsar timing arrays where you get these grids of pulsars that you use as probes for distant gravity waves obviously you can get the direction of the gravity wave incoming by the fact that it will hit different pulsars at different times so there'll be a little time delay and that will let you triangulate and then measure the in incoming direction of the gravity wave so you get some directional sensitivity too as well as measuring the strength of the gravity wave by the strength of its effect on the pulsar timing so this is is exciting to the people who work on pulsars and they're really working hard to try and get the technologies to set up these arrays of pulsars that they can monitor enough to start detecting gravity waves that way. All right, uh, two more questions, I think. Um, so the next question is, why are orbits elliptical instead of circular or any other shape? What's the reason behind this other than the fact that Kepler says so? Right, so in, in um, Kepler's or rather in the Newtonian theory of gravity, which from which you can derive Kepler's laws, that's an experiment, but oh, that's a little calculation that freshman physicists do and astronomers all the time. Um, the, the circular case is just, is just an equal, uh, is just a special case of the elliptical general case. So to, that's true, of course, mathematically in the description of shapes too. Uh, uh, a circle is just an ellipse of zero ellipticity. Now, what it means physically in terms of an orbit is uh, that the rate, that there are two components of the energy. There's a gravitational potential energy because a, an orbiting object is responding to the gravity of a star. That's why it's moving. And it also clearly has a kinetic energy, has an energy of motion, half mv squared. In an elliptical orbit, there's, or a circular orbit, um, both of these components of energy are there. In a circular orbit, the gravitational potential energy never changes because the distance to the star never changes. And the kinetic energy never changes because in a circular orbit, the velocity is always the same. So these two numbers, these two components of energy are equal and they neither change. In the general case of an elliptical orbit, uh, the kinetic energy is constantly changing because the velocity is changing in the ellipse and the potential energy is changing because the planet or object is moving closer and further away from the star and they change in such a way as to offset each other so that the sum of the two the total energy in the orbit is constant and newton's law is just the origination of how you derive that relationship all right the final question for today is uh, was the discovery of gravitational waves the final frontier for the for the validation of general relativity or are there other aspects of general relativity that still need to be experimentally verified? Um, that's a good question. Good question to finish with. Um, no, it's not the final frontier. It's, a, it's an incredible step forward and it's the beginning, the birth of a whole new field and a whole new way of testing general relativity 
in the situation of strong gravity. But what's also in front of us, and those experiments are going to also start happening in the next five to ten years, are other tests of gravity in the strong regime. And of course, the ultimate uh, test cases for that are black holes. So the LIGO detection, the first detection of gravity waves, was from uh, the inspiraling of black holes with each other. Gravity waves, however, can be produced by supernovae, by produced by neutron stars orbiting each other or orbiting black holes. So you don't have to have a black hole involved to generate gravity waves. So the gravity wave detectors will find all sorts of things. But these other tests of general relativity will sort of home in on the most extreme gravity situations, which are black holes. And to keep it short, I would say the most exciting experiments that are upcoming involve the black hole at the center of our galaxy. It turns out that um, the black hole at the center of our galaxy, about a 4 million solar mass black hole, about 28,000 light years away, is almost uniquely situated to study in detail. And that's because the stellar mass black holes that we know dozens of in the nearby galaxy, their event horizons are exceptionally small in angular terms. They're less than a millionth of an arc second. That's way beyond anything you can observe, even with an interferometer. So we cannot see down to the scale of the event horizon for stellar mass black holes. And if you talk about the, the large black holes in distant galaxies and quasars, those black hole event horizons are much bigger because the black holes are much bigger, but the distances are thousands or millions of times further. So they're not any easier to see or see the event horizon size than this, the stellar mass black holes near us in the galaxy. The galactic center black hole is this perfect sweet spot because it's a pretty large black hole. It's millions of times the mass of the sun, and it's only a few tens of thousands of light years away. So that event horizon is the largest event horizon we are likely to see ever, anywhere. It's the one in the center of our galaxy. And the Event Horizon Telescope, um, which is a interferometer based on millimeter observations, which gets you the finest resolution at radio wavelengths, are poised to try and make images of the event horizon itself or the shadowing of the event horizon on background material and also to watch stars as they loop in and out of the intense gravity near the event horizon and perhaps are even swallowed by the black hole. This is an incredible test of general relativity to be able to do this on a black hole in our own galaxy in real time, watch these stars fall in, be devoured, see the shadowing of the event horizon, and it's only really a few years away. So very exciting prospect. And an entirely new test of general relativity, totally different from the gravity wave uh, detections of LIGO. Thanks very much. It was some interesting questions this week, as always, and we'll be back with you in a couple of weeks. Goodbye.